A New Zealand food story is brought to you by the Balance Farm Environment Awards. Ah, he's been open for 18 months now. I'm super proud of what we've achieved. But now I want to move on and discover what's next for this restaurant. We have to unearth more things in this country. I know they're out there. I know there's some amazing suppliers. How can I be the best I can be if I don't go visit these people? If I don't go learn from them, understand them, understand the ingredients? You can't find the answers to those questions in the restaurant, on the hotline, sweating your bollocks off, plating food every night. You have to get out there. So we're going to. That's what we're doing. <laughs>
And when you get to the bottom, grab hold of a piece of wheat or something and just stay dead still. Well done, man. Woo! <laughs> it's awesome. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Far out. Awesome, bro. You were coming down asking for a job, Biggs. <laughs> I'm good, I'm cooking a good wood for you, brother. Hell yeah. Cool, isn't it? It's really interesting with butterfish. You dive down and the butterfish are gone. And then you just have to chill there, holding your breath. And you just wait and you wait. And, and the little buggers pop out of nowhere. And they always pop out right when you're almost out of breath. Is that another nice fish? So Ben's spent at least three so far. You've been doing well. Oh, thank you. I've got a great teacher. Puff. It's got five there, eh? Yeah, it takes it out that you don't realise. I think that patience thing, and it's that juxtaposition between being out of breath and having patience to wait for the fish. Yeah. It's like pulling you in two different <laughs> ways, you know? Yeah. It's really challenging. It's a very hard job. When you just came down on your first dive next to me, yeah. and you slid on next to me, and I was yeah. looking around, and then I look at you, and you're still there. Uh, and I look at you, and you're still there, and I was like, oh, man, a lot. <laughs> this is cool. Uh, I'm a little yeah. competitive, eh? I wasn't going to I wasn't going up <laughs> <for you>. <laughs> After getting put through my paces at the bottom of the ocean, I'm ready to celebrate, but the job's not even close to being done. So for MPI and part of our special permit, they've wanted us to record the size yeah. of each fish. Yeah. So over the few years of our special permit, they can see what impact we're having on the different reefs. Yeah. If we come back to this reef several times and the size reduces a lot, yeah. then we know we're having quite an impact on it and we can start doing something about it. We also uh, watch that we're not putting too much pressure on one reef, so we, we spread air for it right around the coast yeah. as much as we can. The bonus of what we do as well, we can cover the whole coast. Yeah. So with other fishing methods, the tide can affect them quite a yeah. bit. Well done. There's so much work in it. Yeah. Well, it's a long process, but we can work on quality. We can't, we can't do volume, yeah. but we can do quality. And that's what we want at the restaurant. It's lunchtime, so while I get started filleting the beautiful butterfish, Tim heads down for another look. What a beautiful creature. This is amazing. Like, if these guys can um, bring octopus in really fresh like this, it's a real bonus for us because often octopus are a byproduct of the crate fishing. And they just get chucked on the deck and left there. So, if you can catch a live octopus, get it on ice, um, dispatch it quickly, and get it to the restaurant, you, you, we never get octopus like this. Butter, what's this one? West Gold. West Gold butter, mate. Best butter in the country. So we're going to make uh, butterfish hot dogs. It's definitely a bit of a luxury, having lunch cooked while I'm at it. When it, with free diving, you don't eat a lot of food. It affects your free diving. So it's a bit of fruit to a muesli bar, and then I'll go the whole day, six, seven hours without eating. And so what is that? Your metabolism sort of ramping up and processing food, or? Yeah, sort of as you process your food or digest your food, you're using oxygen to digest it. Ah, OK. So uh, that's the theory behind it. it it's yeah. funny, like, I've, I've been, we've been out for a few hours now, and I haven't even been hungry. No, you don't feel it, literally, until you get out and you're heading home. From a sustainability perspective, spearfishing is the ultimate, right? Well, it's very selective. There's no bycatch. Basically, you see the fish in front of you, you choose to spear that fish and you shoot it. Yeah. So you don't target undersized fish and you yeah. don't target things that you're not targeting. I mean, you're not after as well. We're not smashing down big pots yeah. or we're not losing gear. It's just us in the water, choosing a fish, shooting it. Oh, that smells good. Look how it's twisted like that. It's crazy. Yeah. They often do this uh, when they're fresh. The so fresh ah. butterfish twist. It's my secret sauce. Uh -huh. It's sort of like a Russian dressing, so uh -huh. dill, capers, gherkins, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So how'd you get into spearfishing? My first memory of spearfishing was Dad found a fish in a rock pool. <laughs> it was quite a big rock pool, probably really? four or five times the size of this boat, and it took me several goes, but I finally got it and proudly took it back to cook. So um, it was the mighty leather jacket. <laughs> <laughs> but it was beautiful. I loved eating it, you know, and I was proud as punch. Always had a passion for the sea, always, always loved it. Now it's just awesome to be able to include that as my job, you know. So from your side, pretty pretty cool to come out and see where your food comes from, I guess. This is, this yeah. is all part of your journey. It's, it's, I, I need to tell your story better. I mean, that's my job. That's what's important to me, like hearing your story, coming out here, seeing the, seeing the ocean, seeing this part of New Zealand, because there's no other part of New Zealand like Marlborough Sounds, is there? No, no. It's, so, it's so unique. 
some for the crew. Oh, thanks, man. Cheers, buddy. Chin chin. Thank you so much. Mm. It's been an awesome day, thank you. Oh. It's been good having you here. We're proud of what we do. It's awesome to be able to showcase it, so. Right, you should yeah. be proud. Thanks for coming along. Coming up, I see an old friend at the market and we head over the hill to Nelson. The beautiful thing about farmers markets is that they're a snapshot of the season. We're here in Marlborough at one of New Zealand's best farmers markets at the best time of year, height of summer, so let's go check it out. So Shiro Black Amber. The Black Amber is what you'd want. These are the ones that I keep having to tell the guys how to fondle their plums, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and like yeah. a cricket ball. Do it like a cricket ball. So you want to... That one's slippery. That's not right. Your plums oh, are so good. Great. Love you. Thank you, Ben. See you later. Much love. Bye. All right, what a haul. You're always looking to stumble upon some hidden treasure at the market, and Cranky Goat Cheese is one of those treasures. Wow, look at this. <laughs> So we have here the cranky goat on this side and moody cow on this side. When we started out, we were doing 180 kilos a month. Yeah. We're now doing about between 1.4 and 1.6 tonnes a Mate, month. you guys are cranking. Uh, we're cranky. I don't know <laughs> cranky. So um, with all our naming, we don't use Canonbert Brie because that's the regions in France. Yeah. So we try to make it original to us. OK, great. So this is called Reginald. Uh, Reginald is Helen's grandfather. And what's really cool, he was a Welshman and there's a connection to the Maori Battalion because he fought alongside the Maori wow. Battalion at Monte Cassino. Wow. So it's a really cool connect. We're trying to put connections as we go through. And that's amazing because, you know, you, you, you sort of borrow from the greatest cheesemakers of the world. You bring those techniques back here and make it New Zealand. What's quite beautiful about it is the stunning look of the black of the of the ash. We ash it and then the next day the white mould will have already started to have grown. Oh my gosh. This one here is equivalent cheese, but this is called the Bob. The Bob. Bob. <laughs> You can't say that without a smile on your face. So this is going to be slightly more creamy because we're using cow's milk. I love it when it gets that little bit of... That gooiness. Like, oh. So that area there is called the cream line. The cream line. And I then we have that. the piece in the centre is the paste, and oh, then the rind gosh. on the outside. So longer we leave that, greater that cream. That cream line will slowly move in. It's got great acidity meets richness, you know what I mean? It's I a nice that. balance. Yeah, I, I really love that when I'm trying to create a dish. You're always trying to strike that balance, you know? Yeah. I'm just trying to think about, you know, balance on our cheese board, yeah. and our cheese board at Ahi does definitely needs to be refreshed. So I think our customers are going to really love this one. The, you know, the one with the ash, and it's just striking when you look at it sideways like that. You know, you can see, see the colour difference, and it's also tastes amazing. Thank you very much. Man, you pick off this! <laughs> awesome, thank you. <laughs> These figs are the best figs in New Zealand. Look at that. The size of tennis balls. So I love a good farmer's market and Blenheim has totally delivered. This is one of the best. Totally visit. From Blenheim we head up over the Whangamoas to Nelson. And 20 minutes out of Nelson is the village of Upper Maltere. What I love about Upper Maltere is the community vibe. And at the heart of the community for over 150 years is New Zealand's oldest pub, the Maltere Inn. I love a good pub. And this pub comes highly recommended by Tim the Spear Fisherman. This is his local. What's up, mate? How are you? Man, how are you, man? All good. good to see you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, not a problem, man. It's where the magic happens. Pretty much. Oh, cool. It's an awesome little kitchen, eh? Yeah, we get a lot done, yeah, for such a small space. Yeah. yeah, managed to put it out. What's it like working in the oldest pub in New Zealand? It's awesome, eh? I love this spot. Uh, yeah. This area, I think it's just, uh, yeah, it's magic, eh? You've got everything you need here, you know? Lots of artisanal products around the area as well. It's, uh, yeah, it's tidy. Do you know who recommended us to come here was your mate, uh, Tim the Spear Fisherman, Tim Barnett. Oh, Barnett. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I hear he's a local here. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You Is get the call that he's coming down, you're in for a long night. <laughs> All right, man, we can't wait to see the food. 
Yeah. And um, thank you so much for having us. Not a problem, man. Hope you enjoy soon. it, eh? Awesome, buddy. Cheers. In 1853, the Motere Inn opened. And even back then, artisan providers of fruit, hops and tobacco came here to tell tall tales. And as a nod to the old school, Carl's Pighead dish is a Motere Inn classic. Good. Holy moly, that looks good. So what you've got here is the terrine made from the head itself. Uh, pig's ear wafers from the stacked up ears cooked. Wow. Uh, pate made from the pig's tongue. Bit of sauce, crabiche, bit of salad. Thanks, Carl. No looks problem, amazing. Man. Enjoy. Wow. It's almost like a little sauce crabiche here, you know. It's a classic condiment to things like pig's head. Look at these ears. You see how he's done it? He's like, he's, he's probably poached them, laid them up, stacked them into a terrine or a press. And when it's cold, he's cut it really thin and then deep fried it. It's like crackling on steroids, that. If you've ever cooked a pig's head, it's quite a meaty thing around the snout and you've got the skin in there as well. I mean, to a layman it would sound disgusting, but the French say, tout est bon dans le cochon, and that means everything in the pig is good. I mean, this is pub food at its finest, really. Coming up, I'm off to see more pigs, and we head home to Ahi to make most of the surprise ingredient from Marlborough. The small village of Upper Maltiri, outside Nelson, is home to a bunch of creative and productive locals. Two of those locals are Miles and Steph, who over generations have perfected the craft of preserving meats at the Sausage Press Deli. Miles, Steph, how, how are you? Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Good, good to see you. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Nice to see you. Thanks for having us. This Thanks for coming. So this is it. This That's is it. Press. This is the weapon. Yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like an old Captain Cook cannon or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. 1914 cast iron, brought in from uh, the UK. Wow. From the Silent Machine Company, it was called. The Silent Machine? Yeah, yeah. So they were known for more for their manufacturing of bombs during the war and things wow. like that. My parents started making salamis in this back when I was a kid. Wow. Um, they scored it out of a butchery in Auckland, an old wow. Polish fella. But now, unfortunately, my salami production's too much for this old girl. That's where the logo comes from, because yeah, it's exactly. a hark back to yeah. where it started. Far out. Let's yeah. go have a look. Yeah, come on in. Are we going to make a salami? Pork. Pork shoulder. I love the idea of preserving meat. Like, yep. you think back to ancient times when we didn't have refrigeration. No. And I think people forget these days that you know, salami and these cured meats, uh, these preserved meats, yep. uh, are a way to store Absolutely. food for a long time. We're going to make a salami. This is our signature salami, which awesome. is probably our best seller. Inspired from uh, a market in Annecy. So Annecy in France? Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, so mm. like Lake Annecy and yeah. Lake, Lake Annecy. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. cool, yeah. It's so we were in the market and, yeah, and um, tasting all the salamis and I said to the guy there that we make our own stuff. And he took me back to his house, what? showed me what he was making. Isn't that and great? It was, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's where this one comes from. The sharing of knowledge, that's what it's all about. For the signature salami, Miles uses pork shoulder, which is 30% fat. Fat is super important in salami. It helps preserve the meat, keeps it moist, and fat equals flavour. He adds some secret spices, including coriander and fennel seeds, which are a natural preservative. So no need for any nasties in Miles's recipe. It's all about feel. So what I'm doing at the moment is I've just wound the mint down. It's about the pressure out of here and how tight you hold that to fill it properly. Because uh -huh. if you overfill it, when we twist it in the middle, it'll split. Uh -huh. So that's a full-size salami. Now, I've found in the times that I've been doing this, people don't want a full-size salami. They're daunted by it. So all I do is pinch them, twist them, and then I've got two salamis. Easy. There's a lot of mystery uh, ceremony around making charcuterie. It's quite daunting, even as a chef, to understand how to safely prepare meat that you can store for a long time without refrigeration. It's quite scary. You don't want to get sick. But when you see this process, it's absolutely so easy. Hang on, one check, Tight enough? Oh, it's not, oh, it's not as tight as yours, mate. Soft. I think I cocked up here. Let's do another one. <laughs> I'm sort of fumbling over the string. Yeah. I've got calluses in my fingers from pulling the knots tight. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's something I've always wanted to do, to be honest. Yeah. You know, to share the knowledge is just for me, like, 
the ultimate sign of generosity. Oh. To me, having someone come along and, and ask to see how it's done and stuff like that is what makes it all worthwhile. Really? Because I love oh, it. I cool. love what I do. Yeah. It's the story behind it as much as anything. Yeah. It's the fact that, you know, this is a tradition making salami that dates back years and years and years. Here we are in little old upper Moteri in a container making salami. <laughs> making really good salami. Don't let me down. <laughs> okay, is this a good one? That's a good one. You've got it nice and even. It feels nice and firm. You've got a yeah. good knot at the top. It's not going to come out even. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's put it in the smoker. So this is the beast. This is the beast. This is where it all happens. What is it like? Core 10? Core 10 steel. So about 100 degrees? Yep, about 100 degrees. Okay. That'd be good just to eat them hot like this sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The hot chorizos coming out of here are fantastic. Oh, really? Look at that flavour crusted onto the doors. So I'm in and out of here all day, uh, every day. Yeah. And everywhere I go, even, you know, showering, going out to parties and things, as soon as I arrive, people can smell me. Oh, really? Here yeah. comes the sausage man. Here comes the smoke. <laughs> and I have some friends that have travelled in Europe and uh, when I give them a hug, they reckon it's better than aftershaves. Oh, like really? The smell. Chicks love it, eh? They love it. <laughs> now it's time to go from the brawn to the brains of the operation. OK, so we're going to do a salami tasting. Yes, we are. So this one is the cacciatore, so you can see the colour of the paprika. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you make it all the way from Somerset to end up slicing salami um, in the belly? I came to New Zealand on an RE. How many more British women end up here? And I met a Kiwi man, the salami maker. Um, They're the best type of men in New Zealand, so you did well. <laughs> I did uh, fly back with Adam and he chased me across the world. Did he? He sold his BMW 2002. He chased me to, wow. to the UK and he dragged me back here kicking and screaming. Oh my gosh. Look at that, you look almost see-through. Do you want to try the, the Diablo? Yes, Del Diablo. So this, the chilli number. She's got a nice chilli flavour up front and a kick up behind. Top. So, Steph, what's it like having a husband that stinks of smoke all day? <laughs> I have become nose blind, but um, I do notice it when I've been away for the day and I come home and I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, my God, it's so good. So that's the saucisse on sec right there. Yeah, this one's a really dry one as well. I think that could be my favourite one. The sec, because mm. you get the meat flavour mm. and it's not, it's not overpowered with any other mm. flavours. It's sort of yeah. like nearly jerky or something, you know? Yeah, yeah, when it gets that dry, it's stunning, isn't it? Wow, I could just see that going down in the restaurant like that. You know, glass of vino, just a plate of salami. Mm. Done. A little taste of Tasman. Well, thank you so much for having us. It's been awesome. It's a pleasure. I'm going to order some now, actually, for home. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get it on the menu. Wicked. I already can see it. I think I can smell your husband coming. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. The people here are so warm and genuine, but also generous with their knowledge. I really want to make sure everyone who comes to Ahi appreciates their story and the hard work that goes into their craft. It feels great to be able to show the same love and care to the food that arrives in the door as our suppliers show that ingredient when they harvest it. And Tim is the epitome of that. You know, when you're spearfishing, you never know what you're going to get. You can't just target one species and bring back a bin of that. He needs to be able to bring us a variety of fish. If he grabs an octopus, I want it sent to the restaurant. We're going to do a special just for that day. This dish is octopus roasted over the fire with homemade miso and beans from our garden. Coming up next time, we journey to the Bay of Plenty, where locals produce the finest ingredients desired all over the world. You know, New Zealand truffles are arguably as good as the French. 